Uh, okay, so this uh, presentation is uh, about React, which uh, some, maybe all of you are familiar with. It's a distributed uh, data store written in Erlang, which is uh, topical enough given the crowd. Uh, people familiar with it in the room? or who, what, are, what, peop what are people using here? Couchbase, React, people doing stuff with non-relational databases or... No? Is I'll wait here until I find the truth. <laughs> All right, okay. So, um, right. So React is basically, it's inspired by Amazon created a Dynamo white paper many moons ago. Um, described a type of database where you could choose between uh, consist of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And uh, the React guys, they decided to go and implement something that was pretty similar to that. Um, it's written in Erlang with a couple of key parts are written in C and C++, open source, Apache 2.0 licensed. A uh, little bit about me, so uh, it's my name at the top of the list, uh, Brian Hunt, uh, client service engineer for Basho, which basically means uh, manning a help desk, that type of stuff. Uh, Erlang neophyte, so I've got about two months experience Erlang. Uh, <laughs> Really sick of working on the JVM, so uh, just be nice with me. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, what, what's this crowd here? Is this, uh, this is a developer crowd, or operations, or a mixture somewhere thereof? What you do? Developers. All right. Okay. I know there's some ops crowd over there. BSD guys. <laughs> all right. Cool. Um, right, so we move on. Structure of the talks. This talk is centered around four main areas. Uh, introduction to React as it stands. Uh, introduction to React 2.0. Uh, some information about React 2.0 features. And then some example uses. All right, so uh, what is React? In its most simple sense, it's just a key value store, a giant big hash map distributed around a ring of nodes. Um, it's, in terms of the CAP theorem, consistent, available, partition, tolerant, it's, it focuses on available and partition tolerant. Um, given enough time, all, all, all its values will eventually correct, converge upon the correct values, uh, but it may not always have the correct da values at any given point in time. Uh, it's the ops-friendly database in that just comes with a couple of command line tools. You can minister pretty much everything with that. They're really easy to use. It's self-descriptive. Things like help will give you a list of what's available. Uh, runs on everything, so a wide, wide gamut of systems, uh, BSDs, Linux derivatives, runs on OS X with, you can compile it from source or install it at Homebrew. Uh, Smart OS, Solaris, people are running on a bunch of stuff. Pretty much everything except Windows. I don't know if you can live with that. <laughs> um, so the basic idea is it's a, it's a cluster of distributed nodes. Uh, the performance, is, the performance is, is gained through concurrency. So typically, you put something like a load balancer in front, uh, HA proxy, for example, and distribute reads and writes into the cluster. Um, all nodes participate equally, so there's, there's no... There's no uh, there's no master node. There's, there, there isn't something that you can kill and the whole thing falls apart. So there's no single point of failure. Uh, you lose a node, it's not really the end of the world. Um, you know, replace it at your leisure. Uh, so, as I mentioned, you can easily add or remove nodes. It's scalable, near linear scalability. So add in another box. Uh, you know, you got five boxes, you add another one, you get, you know, expected percentage improvement in performance, you know. Uh, it's, it's highly available, as we discussed, so you've typically got three replicas of all data which is written into it, and that's in a single uh, React cluster. Uh, it's written around an airline core, so uh, there's, there's full tolerance built into the system, both passive and actively. So you've got a uh, read repair, which is when you do a read, it will, it will read from a selection of other nodes if it finds the data is missing. It will, it will take the data and it will write it into the nodes where it's missing. It's also got active anti-entropy, which is a continuous process which runs and maintains your data integrity. It's checking, it's building hashes constantly and verifying that your data is intact and that the replicas are all identical. 
Um, so uh, so got simple deployment model, predictable performance, easy scaling, less tedium, and more sleep. Um, but it was thought that it would be better to make it a little bit more exciting. So uh, <laughs> this, this, is, this is the introduction to React 2.0, which is our next iteration. And it's, it's a major departure from, from what was before. Um, title of this talk is uh, the Swiss Army Database. So it's kind of focusing on the variety of things which are integrated into it and how to move beyond being just a simple key value store. And uh, when we mean the Swiss Army Database, we, we don't mean like this. We've got an enormous collection of uh, mundane, average bits and pieces. Um, it's thinking of something more like a Leatherman, where it's, it's quite well crafted and you've got a small selection of working features. Uh, so, a couple of key features are React data types, CRDTs, uh, full text search, uh, that goes under the code name of Yokozuna, uh, security's been added, uh, configuration has been simplified dramatically. Uh, we've got reduced replicas for when you're running a multi-data center setup. Obviously, if you've got three replicas of all your data on one side uh, on, the, on the source, you don't necessarily want to replicate three copies of it onto the sync side as well. One might be sufficient. All right, so the first part, uh, React data types. Um, okay, so in React 1.4, there was, there, was, there was some stuff like this. There was counters. Uh, it was pretty limited on its own. Uh, you could increment them, you could decrement them, and eventually they'd be consistent. Uh, React 2.0 has added a couple of extra things, such as uh, sets, maps, and registers as distributed data types. And uh, basically the idea is to simplify application development without compromising in terms of uh, availability and partition tolerance. Uh, here's this picture represents uh, how you might represent an email message. We're going to be using this in the training material on Wednesday. So this is an email message uh, modeled as a CRDT. So previously, it was just a key value store. So we referred to the key and the value collectively as the object. Okay. So we got here the object. We got the key, which is message 20. And then we got a, a series of fields, which you might find in an email message. And they're, they're uh, modeled as CRDTs. So first, you got the map CRDT. So that's that's the overall encompassing entity. Uh, these are the attributes of it. So it's a subject, date, body, and in re reply to. Uh, these are known as register CRDTs, which is just a, a binary, which I believe in other languages can be called a string. Um, and then responses, it contains a nested CRDT, which is in this case going to be a set, which are also binaries. And those are the uh, message IDs for messages which have been written as replies to this original email. So that's, that's, that's how you could model something using the new CRDTs. Uh, so looking at how it was before, um, I don't know how many of the audience have, have used React extensively or familiar with stuff like uh, siblings, client-side client -side replication. OK, small number, yeah. Uh, so one of one of the key things in sibling in in React is uh, is the concept of siblings. It's it's not sufficient to just go on a on a last right wins approach. You're never quite sure exactly what's happening to your data. Um, siblings is is kind of like if you've got Git and you've got two people working on it simultaneously. Each has uh, got their own copy of of of, of the um, of the history. Uh, each makes separate changes. The two come into conflict. Uh, they have to be resolved. Who can resolve them? The only person who can resolve it is the person who understands the data, which is typically the developer. So if two people write concurrently to the same object in React without paying attention to well, the commit history, which, is, which in this case is called the v-clock, basically. That's how it manages it. Um, you get a conflict. Next time that you go to do a read, uh, it'll indicate that there's siblings, which means that there's two copies, two or more copies of the data. Um, if, if you want to be polite about it, the thing to do is resolve them. You've got to do it on the client side as it currently stands. And that means taking down the two siblings, 
deserializing them, figuring out what they are, merging them back together and writing them to the server, and, and then you can move on. Um, that's, that's a little bit tedious, though. Okay, so there's a couple of simple use cases of what you might want to do with CRDTs. Um, increment a value, that'll be counters. Append values to an object, so you've got, maybe you're tracking users who are going through your website or something like that. Uh, every time that they go onto a page, you want to update the user object, and you want to add the URL that they went on to, and maybe the time or you know, the referring URL or whatever. Um, you might also want to batch out or remove multiple associated objects. So you might have a set. Uh, you might have another 50 things that you want to add into this set. Um, this, this is something you could do on the client side. It would be a lot nicer if the server could just handle it for you. Okay, so uh, take a look at some examples. So uh, previously, if you were incrementing a value concurrently, um, taking the first client, Okay, so, we, so we, get, we, get, we get an object from React, in this case, pints sold. How many beers have been sold in a particular establishment today? Uh, take it down to the client. It's probably a big blob of JSON. You deserialize it. You got a data structure. Uh, you copy that data structure if it's immutable, or maybe you modify it in place if it is mutable. Uh, I think Erlangers generally veer on the side of immutability. Uh, so you've, in you've incremented that value, you serialize it, and you write it back. Um, but what would happen if another client was doing the exact same thing as you? Um, they, they would get it. Uh, one of the header fields would be the V clock, which indicates where it is in its progression of change. Uh, they deserialize it, they increment it, they serialize it, they send it to the server, and uh, they get a conflict. It's there's, there's two copies of the data, no way for it to work it out. So it would then have to go back to the server, get both the siblings, pull them down, deserialize them, work out some merge logic, serialize them again, and put them back to the server, which is extremely boring. Um. <laughs> uh, OK, so what would be far better would be if that, uh, that type of conflict in resolution could happen on the server rather than you having to do a whole round trip down to the client. It's, there's a variety of reasons why it's unattractive. Um, OK, so, so how would you do it now? Uh, you create a bucket type uh, with the data type of counter, activate it, initialize it with a value, and just send increment or decrement counts to the server. Um, Right. How we used to append to an object, similar, similar story. You fetch the object, deserialize it, maybe you've got a piece of JSON with a list inside it, append an item onto the list, store it, send it to the server, and maybe somebody's done the same thing, so you've got a conflict. Then you go back again and you work out the siblings. You could just shortcut this and just say last write wins, and then you just get completely random data on the server as each of your developers clobbers each other. Um, how do we append to an object now? OK, so you create a bucket type with a data type set, activate it, initialize it, and then you've got a series of commands which you can send to the server. This is, you can send add, remove, add all, and remove, remove all commands. So you can, get this, you can get this stuff to happen on the server. So lower latency, less, less round trip, uh, much better. Uh, complex nest of data. Um, typically, going back again to the analogy of JSON, um, this is infectious. Uh, how would you typically do this before? Unless you're going to invent your own data type, you'd store it on the you'd store it on the server as JSON or XML. Take the entire take take the entire object graph to the client, de deserialize it, mu mutate it, uh, serialize it back again, uh, save it to the database, and, and tedium again ensues. Um, you can be well paid doing that type of work. <laughs> uh, I know I was. Um, how, do you, how do you handle it now? So you've got your CRDTs, so conflict resolutions handle on the server. You manipulate the remote data structures by sending update commands to React. Uh, you, you don't have to worry about the, the, the round trip. Um, it's just basically, it's a lot easier. Have people, has anyone actually made use of CRDTs yet or familiar with these type of things? You, sir, yeah. I'd, how long have you been using them for? All right, okay, quite a while then. Longer than me. <laughs> All right. 
Um, has anyone got any questions about that? No? Okay. Uh, let's see. All right, so... Uh, Yeah, I'm just wondering if I can get this onto screen. I may show you afterwards. Uh, I've I've got a bunch of them. There, it's basically uh, you just you just do a post to the URL, and it's just minus D and the command, just a little JSON thing. So in case if you want to add something onto a set, it's just add colon and then the value. Uh, for, for increment and decrement, you, you specify the command and then the value that you're going to increment or decrement by. And, and it's, it's pretty much like that for all the commands. Obviously, if you're using the React client, there'd be a nicer API for doing it. But all this stuff is still available, just the command line. You can do it you just using curl. All right. Anyone else? OK. All right, so we move on to the next part. Um, Yokozuna, aka Search20. So this is full text search, and it's basically integration with Apache Solar. Um, I don't know anyone here from uh, work with Solar before, or Lucene, or Java background. Yeah, okay, a bunch of people. Has anyone ever used Sphinx or used that as well? No, I use well. All right, slightly less popular. It's it's, it's quite nice to work with that. Um, okay, so. Solar, Solar has been integrated with React. Uh, it runs, it runs a JVM process. It runs Solar in that. It's, it's got some nice glue for looking after uh, Solar's indexes, keeping it up and running, managing its health, etc. Um, it's pretty nice. If you're messing around with it a little bit, it supports the usual uh, stuff with the with the standard extractors. So it'll support things like uh, JSON. Uh, XML, plain text, but they've also managed to integrate it with CRDTs, so you can index straight into, uh, for example, that CRDT that I showed at the start, the email message. So each one of those those fields of that message will be a separate facet, uh, which you can search for indi individually or collectively. So how did we search before? Uh, well, we did have an original React search, and that was basically, uh, well, I'll cover it in a second. We had the original React search, we had secondary indexes, and we have MapReduce. Okay, so the original React search was implemented in Erlang, uh, provided a, a basic subset of Solar functionality. It was perpetually chasing feature parity. Uh, interesting as the exercise was, uh, there was a lot more momentum with the other project, and it was, it was, just, it was just always going to be a game of catch-up. Um, Secondary indexing search. Uh, this is this is quite similar to the type of indexing that you get if you're using DynamoDB or whatever. Um, so you basically, when you write an object, you add some extra metadata onto it, indicating that there's indexes. So it was kind of limited, though. You could have integers or strings, and it was basically an exact match. It would be more like a tag than you know term-based um, search. Um, you could query by an exact match, so all objects which have the secondary index of Joanna, or a range, so you could store dates as, as, as integers as well, and you could, using that mechanism, you could, you could make a selection of all objects between a particular range. Uh, again, it's defined as object creation time. Um, Okay, so there's a couple of limitations of secondary index. Uh, obviously, you don't get any full text uh, term-based query capability. Uh, composite queries required multiple range queries. So if you wanted query for all, all objects which have been tagged with Joanna and were also between a particular subset, a particular range of, pardon me, of dates, uh, the engine would have to do two secondary index queries. Um, each of which would be a coverage query as well, so it would hit basically a third of your nodes. Uh, it wasn't supported on Bitcask as well, which is our preferred storage engine. Uh, it was only supported on level DB and memory, and that was kind of a big one for a lot of people. Um, 
Level DB is slightly less attractive than Bitcask in terms of you don't get the same kind of latency guarantees. As data becomes older, it can take longer to, to retrieve it. So it drops down through the levels. Uh, MapReduce, it wasn't really a runner. It uh, wasn't suitable for real-time querying. Uh, it was designed for scheduled uh, and analytics, and it's basically just not a search engine. Um, so Yokozuna is, is now the preferred sl search solution. Um, security. Okay, previously React didn't have any kind of concept uh, whatsoever of security. Uh, anyone who could who could hit it, uh, any of its interfaces could do whatever they wanted, really. And it was based upon the presumption that if you're running on a cluster, um, you know, this is a typical security thing, like hard on the outside, chewy on the inside. Uh, somebody had gotten to the cluster. Uh, they were already allowed access. There was no point in trying to secure it. Um, there might have been an overhead concern as well. So we React 2.0 now introduces uh, a variety of security mechanisms. So for authentication, uh, there's trust-based security, which is quite similar to what was there originally. So the user's on a trusted connection. Uh, if you're connecting from a particular subnet, you know, site or range, we trust you. Um, any password which is provided is ignored. Um, password is kind of um, the equivalent of Apache HD access files. Um, maintains a, a username, a password hash table. Checks the provided password against the stored hash. Uh, we've got PAM. That's pluggable authentication modules. It exists on pretty much every Linux. I don't know if it exists on OS X or BSDs. BSDs do it as well. Yeah. Solaris originally came from Sun anyway. Uh, so with that, you can just choose any back end you want. If you want to use a relational database or you want to use LDAP or uh, for some stupid reason you want to use a smart card or something, conceivably, uh, you can do that. Um, maybe somebody who actually write a uh, provider for React itself. And lastly, certificate. And this is based upon uh, the client providing a certificate, which, is, which has been signed by a particular certificate certifying authority, um, and if it's validated and the common name matches the requested username, the user's authenticated. So you've got you know, a variety of options there. Um, authorization itself can be per bucket, so you can say this user or group of users are allowed to perform operations on this particular bucket, or buckets, um, or also per operation, so you can also limit users in the same way as you might on a I don't know, MySQL just springs to mind for some reason. Um, so you can say that user, particular users are allowed to do gets, puts, deletes, add indexes, run map reduce queries. There's, there's a bunch of those. Um, anyone got any questions? No, self-explanatory? All right. Okay. Um, right. Cuttlefish. This is another one of the new improvements. Um, Simplified configuration management. Um, one of the things which kind of occurred to me when I first looked at React was that the command line tools were really nice, but uh, I couldn't figure out how to write a set expression which would match square brackets in order that I could uh, append or delete or modify sections of the configuration file. Um, the old configuration file was just a huge list of terms. I understand this is very easy to work with in Erlang. You just basically read it in, evaluate it, and there's your data structure. But from the point of view of administrating it or modifying it in ad, ad hoc ways or for a variety of things, grappling through it, all this stuff, it's a little bit of a pain because traditional Unix command line tools don't really understand um, an Erlang terms file. Um, another, feat, another thing about it as well was that you can very easily lose, uh, miss a comma, miss a bracket or whatever, um, especially for me uh, coming to it as, you know, not being an Illuminati of Erlang. Uh, the error messages meant absolutely nothing to me. Uh, so I was, you know, going back and taking old copies of files and stuff, it was quite difficult. Um, 
that's been dramatically simplified now. So new configuration file format has shrunk down to something like this. Um, Cuttlefish itself is an open source project. And my understanding, just from reading through this commit messages and stuff, is that you can provide a mapping file for any kind of a properties file format like this, and it will map it onto uh, onto the the Erlang term um, term format, I guess, for a better want of a better word. So, uh, so what kind of stuff can you do now that it's been simplified a little bit? Uh, well, for one thing, you could run little commands like this if you're a Unix admin. Um, so this one's just matching on a particular line of, uh, of, of the React conf file. Uh, if, it matches the, if it matches the part that says it starts at ring size, uh, it substitutes that entire line for ring size equals to 128. And this is Z shell as well. It does it recursively on the etc. directories and each and every of the React conf. It sounds like a trivial thing, but when you're trying when you're trying to figure out how to get this thing running, switching various features on and off, stuff like this is gold dust, you know. Uh, configuration management I'm fairly hugely biased towards Ansible at the moment. Uh, it's kind of configuration management de jure, but it also supports this type of thing where you're looking to match a specific line of a file, and uh, if it doesn't exist, append it. If it does exist, replace it. Um, I guess this is the type of stuff that only makes sense if, you, if, you're, if you're having to do operation stuff as, as a daily chore. just makes things a lot easier. Uh, what we got next? Right. Reduce replicas for multiple data centers. Um, so I think I mentioned it slightly earlier on in the talk. Um, by default, React's going to create three copies of your data. Now, everything that you put into it is three copies by default. You can increase it or decrease it, uh, but three is generally what's going to happen. Um, if you're in a situation where you want to create a backup of your, of your data, there's two kind of scenarios where people are working with multi-data center replication. One is to have a hot, hot backup on standby, where it's, okay, that building uh, sank into the, into the ground. It's, it's, it's lost. Uh, flick the switch router switches over to the to a new infrastructure and you've got a copy of everything which is running and which is you know as near as possible up to date and it just it runs from there you're going to keep that running for a while but another situation is where people just want to back up their data and they just want to have an off an offsite copy an offsite copy of their data maybe using a different uh, different hardware configuration uh, Maybe using maybe using a RAID system which has got stronger consistency guarantees than what they're running in production. And for this case, it's it's a question of you want to reduce how many replicas of your data there are. So you can configure it on a on a per bucket basis. Um, and this this is something a lot of our customers come to us looking for. Um, strong consistency. This is another thing which has come in. Um, and this is basically saying that you you're not satisfied with eventually consistent data um, you want particular particular buckets of data to to remain consistent um, so you, that that's that's a new thing that can be that can that's come in now can be added um, so you go look at some uh, example uses this new functionality um, with some slightly contrived examples okay so uh Taking an example of, I've just been looking at uh, just a workflow that I had before for, I used to work in a social media firm. So we had uh, a bunch of stuff coming in to us. We'd have, we'd have documents, so we had like web crawlers going crawling the web, uh, reading everyone's uh, blogs. We had Twitter, so we hooked up to their fire hose. Um, we had other providers, people that would, uh, that would provide us basically the equivalent of newspaper clippings. Uh, we'd receive all that data. And bear in mind, this is also like relational database technologies. Um, send it down a message bus, which would act as a, as a buffer of sorts. Um, we get to a storage writers. We had a UUID generator, so we had something that for every item that came in, we create a unique ID for it. Um, and then it then it split off in two directions. Um, 
of one part will go to an index writer, and in our case, uh, we put it into Sphinx. So Sphinx basically mimics uh, a MySQL database you insert, but you're not really, it's not really storing the data, it just indexes whatever you put in there. Um, and one of the things that you've got to do with that is provide some kind of ID. So when you do a search, you can then resolve, you get a number back, for, you get a list of numbers or identifiers, uh, which are the UUIDs of the data which you've then stored somewhere else, in this case in, in an actual relational database somewhere. Um, so generate the UUID, store it into the data store with the UUID per, per, uh, per object. Send it off to the index writer is also with that same UUID. Uh, and then it would go into Sphinx or Lucene. Um, occasionally, those servers would blow up, and then we'd have to re-index re all that data again. And it was quite painful maintaining the integrity between the two. Uh, we also send stuff into a replica data store, so that's, that's just using like slave relational databases. Um, any questions on that? Uh, standard. Uh, so basically, if we were to do it now, it would kind of shrink down quite a lot. Um, you go to documents or Twitter and our, our blog posts and stuff, receivers, send it down to a React client and send it into React. React React's going to handle uh, the, the UUID generation. It's going to handle the... Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to manage the solar indexes, um, it will replicate them, uh, and it will also handle the indexing as well. So you just got a bunch less uh, moving parts. Um, another example. Uh, so another thing that we used to do is that we'd want to create a, for a given search term, which one of our clients had uh, asked us to monitor, um, we'd want to index it, and we'd also want for each day, they would want to be able to get a list of every single mention, which would be made of them for a particular day. Um, so how this worked was kind of brittle as well. Um, we received data through the receiver again. Um, oh, this, this, this example being for the earlier version of, of React. Um, slightly, slightly better than using relational database and Sphinx. Uh, so we receive data. Uh, we'd we'd send the entity into the React client. Uh, we'd use that to post an object to React, and we'd also um, we'd keep a buffer there. Sorry, the buffer shouldn't be on the React client. It should be on the receiver. Apologies. Um, and that buffer would contain a list of all of all the items which we'd inserted into the data store. Um, some problems with this, if the job crashed halfway through um, and you then go back and you, you put the items back in again, do you get duplicates? Have you lost some of that stuff in the indexes? The term-based inverted indexes. Is everyone familiar with that concept? Term-based inverted indexes? Yeah? No? But basically, uh, you open a book, it's got an index at the back, which has just got like, you know, Erlang, uh, your Erlang book. It's got a list of all the pages and all the terms. Uh, so you can go to the back of the book, and I'm interested in, um, I don't know, NIFs. You go to page 47. Um, the same concept. Uh, you're doing all that, that hard labor yourself. And also, you, can, you have to write it in one go. Or again, you come back to the problems of siblings. Uh, so the new, the new approach, which is much easier, it's just uh, you're receiving stuff, you send the entity to React Client, and you post the object, and you also post a update to an add command to the index CRDT. So that's your term-based inverted index. You're just appending into that constantly. Um, so it's a lot easier to work with. People get the point of that? Yeah? It's, it's simple stuff. Um, OK, so we're running slightly early on this talk. Has anyone got any questions? Uh huh. Uh, I suppose uh, it's working. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's super that you have also solar cluster. You have a solar node for each 
React Node, or how does it work? React, React manages all that. So when, when React starts up an individual node, it, fires all, it, it, it starts up a JVM process. So you are, your Erlang process, you've got a JVM process sitting within it, and, and, and that's what's actually running uh, Solar. So you don't, have to start, you don't have to start Solar and then start React or maintain two daemons or whatever. It's completely encapsulated. Right, so you have one Solar node per React node, right? That's that's correct, yeah. And in your last uh, in your last slide, uh huh, that inver uh, how do you call it? Term based uh, inverted index. Yeah, I, I guess Solar also has like inverse indexes or something. Yeah, like it's that. a duplication of functionality. The thing is, uh, with Solar, it's going to there's 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 a, there's a use case for doing this. Um, Sometimes you just want a bunch of IDs that you can just say, give me all the IDs for the last hour, and, and you can retrieve them in a, in a single operation, and they're already been stored in, in React. Uh, you get an object, pull it back, and it's got all the values. Whereas um, the emphasis with Solar is more for full text querying and more ad hoc type of stuff. So, so for performance, you can use term-based inverted indexes and just store them there in a key and append to them. So you go, give me everything that was inside the last hour. But if you want to do something specific where you're like, I want to search for Joe blogs and the date was this, then, then it's time to hit Solar and, 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 and do it that way. Right, for advanced query, you know, something like that. Precisely, yeah. Otherwise, I was guessing what's faster, uh, query to React or Solar, you know? I, I would have imagined the query to React would be faster. It's just a, it's just a get. Right, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Anyone else? Briefly, can you sort of go into that a little bit more detail, sort of what you what you get not and what you lose? Not not in a huge amount of detail. Uh, I pretty much have to come back to you on that. Um, I kind of focus on the areas which I found most interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, there's there's been a slight bias there. Um, I I I don't know. Maybe my colleague Dan can can offer some information on that. It's it's no, it's on the list of features. Uh, which I'm interested in, it's pretty much down at the, at the very end. Um, do you have a specific use case that, you, that, that made you interested in it? Uh, not particularly at this point, right. no. I was just curious yeah. what, you, what you're giving up and what, you're, um, and what you can actually gain from that. Well, I don't know. Th this is pure conjecture, what I'm going to say right now, but I would imagine it's probably a lot slower. Um, but, it, but it will offer a guarantee that the data will always be in a particular state at a particular point in time. Uh, I personally don't have a use case in mind, which I can think of where it would be useful. Um, maybe, maybe for, uh, for maybe if you're making your own authentication provider, hospital data, sort of observation data, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, possibly, yeah. Well, uh, uh, Actually, when you make that consistent query, there's a chance you'll get a I can't serve this request right now. So there's a trade off whether you'd rather get a back a I can't help you right now, please come back later when the, the cluster's healthy, or would you rather have maybe some data that's reasonably up to date? Maybe if you're serving some information that's not critical, you want to just favor availability, maybe serve something that's a few minutes out of date or even a few seconds out of date. But if at any point you make a request and your cluster's unhealthy with, with this kind of strong consistency, then you need to know that you won't get that data if there's some, them, some kind of unhealthy state. So it just gives you both those options. So um, it, you, get the, yeah, you get the option to decide what you want to do with it then. Um, but drop by the, the Basher booth and we can talk about it more. Ju judging by uh, what I've read in the tabloid press recently, it's, it's generally sufficient to just say that the patient was alive at some time in the last couple of days. <laughs> Quick question about the Solar integration. Do you sure. support uh, all the features of a particular version of Solar? Is it as well defined as something like that? Or if are you just uh, exposing as much of the Lucene API um, as you can? I, th I think the, the, the Lucene uh, administration interface is available um, when, you, when you're running React. So that's exposed. So you can go directly to that. Um, 
in terms of in terms of I I, I, w I would imagine yes. I don't know. I, ca I can't answer right now exactly which version of uh, of Lucene it's 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 running, but um, you know you can create a, you can create a schema for a particular bucket. Say what you want to index and how you want it indexed. You can you can specify what extractors you want to use and all that stuff. Um, one thing which occurred to me today, which would be kind of interesting, is just seeing if uh, I know Lucene comes with extractors for <laughs> for Microsoft Word uh, documents, PDFs, that type of stuff as well. So it would be interesting to see if you could get that running. Um, that would be that would be quite an interesting thing. Yeah, and how well would it support? It, the, the solo that we run has about um, nine of our own patches. Uh -huh. How uh, tolerant would the uh, the kit be for uh, applying those to the solo that you're running? Depends on the patches. I mean, sure. Uh, if it was just a question of just taking all the jar files out, deleting them, and throwing in your ones, and just seeing if magic happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, going down that route is always going to be fraught with peril anyway, uh, because if you are doing that, you you know, you you're going to be running pretty much an unsupported configuration. It it may work. It it may very well work. But when it doesn't, you may find that you you know you, you can't get quite quite the same level of uh, expertise in your configuration. You go for support or whatever. But I mean, it's it's open source. There's, there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Um, but it's just it's just that trade-off. Uh, what co what kind of open source version of uh, uh -huh. React. It's not part of you know React Enterprise or something like that. No, it's in the open source version. Yeah, uh, I should probably leave these questions for a sales guy rather than asking them in the talk. So I'll no, there's, there's the no floor. reason not to ask them. No, um, it's. Uh, I'm kind of curious though. Uh, what kind of stuff have you done, like custom stuff? Um, we uh, we contributed one or two of them back uh -huh. to the community. Okay. Um, Although they were, the, you know, the kind of patches which were sort of, I, I didn't think they were really going to be accepted. It was just, mm -hmm. oh yeah, trunks go in a different direction. But if you need this feature right now, you know, yeah, just okay. how to patch it into th Solo 3.6 kind of things. Ah. Um, can, it, there's a lot of little, you know, things that are part of the Lucene API that's not exposed to Solar. So some of them are, are quite trivial. They're just, you know, make such and such a switch configurable. You know, this kind uh -huh. of stuff, which yeah, is very yeah. convenient for operational aspects of running a big Solar operation, uh -huh. but aren't very profound. You know divergences from and from and core solar. These these modifications uh, are they are they are they on on main? Are they on uh? Well, on we the main just you know we 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 have patches and then we grab the latest and we apply them and we mm -hmm. hack until they work. You know it's. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to do it, but in terms in terms of supporting it, uh, sure. the, you know, it's it's a, it's a less a less supported configuration. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, this uh, solar integration, do you consider it as a competitor for solar cloud? Is, is uh, it a repl replacement or? Ooh, I, I haven't actually heard of that product. I mean, uh, solar cloud is basically a dis distribution layer for solar, so you can distribute uh -huh. your data on several nodes. Otherwise, you just have one solar installation, and yeah. But yeah. if you use React, you do you do you distribute the data? Yeah, it is. Okay, then the solar index is your distributor as well. Okay. Um, I don't know. I I, I have no idea in terms of like you know, corporate strategy or whatever. <laughs> mainly, mainly an ops guy. Okay. Um, it sa it sounds similar. I I I think that this this is a problem that you know it's it people come back to time and time again. They want to index their data. They want to have it in a data store, and they got to manage the indexes and they got to manage the data. The two get out of sync, and it's it's just you know it's it's just craziness. Uh, how do the CRDT scale? If you like append and append and append forever, does it slow down significantly? Or uh, Chris Me uh, Melkajan, or Melkajan, uh is probably the guy to ask about that, and he'll be down at our, our booth as well later on. I can introduce you if you want. I do know there are there are some limitations to it as well. Any any given CRDT, you don't want to grow above one meg in size. That's generally the ballpark figure for. Objects in React, it doesn't like when they get above a megabyte in size. You can do it, 
but it can it can it can mess around with your latencies and it's just not a good thing to do. So there is there is there is a limit in terms of how big you can make those CRDTs. Um, in terms of the performance overhead of garbage collection and stuff like that, uh, Chris would probably be the guy to ask. He'd give you a much better idea. Um, I know I know he's been benchmarking it extensively for one of our customers, so maybe you can share some of that info with you. All right. Anyone else? You focused on beer now? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. Thank you.